This episode is brought to you by Brook Linen. Winter blues meet your match. Brook Linen adds color to the bedroom with limited edition drops of award winning sheets, towels, and more. Whether you're starting out in a new home or adding flair to your setup, Brook Linen's customizable bedding bundles put everything you need in one place. Make spring come early with fresh home essentials in store and at brooklinen.com. Use code SPOTIFY for $20 off. Hi, reader. I'm Cindy Burnett. Welcome to my award-winning podcast, Thoughts from a Page, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. On the show, I chat with authors whose books I have enjoyed about their new releases, and I give you a peek behind the curtain of the publishing industry with my Behind the Scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. If you're looking for a community of readers, bonus content, and a chance to read books before they hit the shelves, I hope you'll consider joining my Patreon group which is filled with a wonderful bunch of book lovers. The link to join is in the show notes. Today, I'm chatting with Deborah Jackson Taffa about Whiskey Tender. I just cannot say enough good things about this beautiful book. What I really loved about this story was that Deborah weaves in her own personal narrative while at the same time chronicling what was happening in the wider Native American communities throughout the United States and how that informed her upbringing and her own story. She is a citizen of the Quachin Nation and a descendant of Laguna Pueblo. Deborah earned her MFA in Iowa City and is the director of the MFA in Creative Writing Program at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is the winner of the Penn Jean Stein Grant for Literary Oral History. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and my eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. I first gave AG1 a try because I needed more energy. Since drinking AG1 daily, I have definitely felt more energized. Not only does AG1 deliver my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more, but it's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day. I know with AG1, I'm giving my body high-quality nutrition. Every batch of AG1 goes through a rigorous testing process, so you know it is safe. And AG1 ingredients are sourced for absorption, potency, and nutrient density. AG1 is the supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily, and I am really happy to have them sponsoring my show. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drink, A-G, the number one, dot com, slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. Welcome, Deborah. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. I absolutely love Whiskey Tender, and I cannot wait to talk about it with you. Thank you. Your writing is just stunning, and I think your story is so important, and so I'm very glad you wrote it, and I have a lot of questions. But before we dive into those first, I want to say congrats on the Publishers Weekly and Booklist starred reviews. Very, very well deserved. I was happy to see that. Thank you. That's wonderful. Yes, I was so happy myself. I bet. And then second, would you give me a quick synopsis of Whiskey Tender for those that haven't read it yet? It tells the story of my childhood both on and off the reservation, a coming of age during which my character and my persona as a child kind of comes to terms with what it means to be an American, kind of an aspiring student and someone who is trying to improve her life while at the same time learning about all of the ways in which my culture has been kind of excluded from the American dream and the American mythologies that we learn in school and we learn in mainstream, you know, society. There's kind of a a way in which Native kids, I think, have to learn how to walk in two worlds and decide between two value systems. And I think that the book does a good job of showing what that sort of struggle is like. I think that it um, is kind of a humorous take on what it is to grow up American while also being tribally enrolled and trying to figure out your place in this country. So it's set in the 70s and 80s, and it tells the story of a father who is an ex-con, I guess, you know, he went to prison as a minor, although for the majority of my life, he was 
kind of a workaholic and you know a, a, a standard family man and a mother who was very strict and very Catholic and kind of you know the kind of resistance in my childhood to being this modern my, model minority, but kind of being pressured to be that by my mom and dad. So what made you decide to tell your story and share your experiences with others? One of the things that you note is that you feel your story is very common, that it has happened to many people. But we don't see much about your story. At least I feel like I don't. And I look for these type of stories because they are fascinating to me. And I feel like they are very important. And I want to make sure they are shared with as many people as possible. But I don't feel like we see a lot of them. I appreciate that. I think that was the impetus for me to write the story. With social media, I think younger Native people are feeling more seen. You know, there are a lot of movements online and there's this new renaissance, they're calling it, in Native literature and storytelling. But in my childhood, especially in the 1970s and 1980s, um, you know, I grew up in the Reagan years. It was a time of conservatism. There weren't many voices who were pushing to have Native stories be heard. And so it's it sounds funny to say, but I always knew I was a writer from the time I was very young. It was the one thing that I was very talented at. My teachers always told me that I had very wonderful language skills. So I always thought that I would write. And I think when I first started writing, it really came from this desire to write wrongheaded notions about who Native people were, you know, in this country. I mean, I think the government def defines us as wards of the state, and that kind of implies like, this inability to better our own circumstances. And yet my family around me that I saw, my father, he was such a hard worker and he did so much to try to improve our lives for me and my sisters. You know, he was a welder. He worked at a power plant. It was a very dirty job, but he always told us we could be whatever we wanted to be in this country. He tried to fill us with notions of America as a meritocracy. And you just don't see that kind of struggle in the media. You don't see modern Native families who are actually improving their lot in life. And yet, I have so many Native girlfriends in my age bracket that are lawyers, that are professors, that are working in business. And those stories just get sidelined. You know, for, you know, people really have seen a lot of the story of the commodity cheese and the kind of down and out people on the reservation, but they haven't seen the stories of those people who have kind of migrated into cities and towns, gone to college and become professional Americans who are out there in the world dealing with problems just like and issues like everyone else. I wanted to portray that. I agree with all of that. And unfortunately, I feel like with both news and sometimes social media, negativity is what sells. And it's such a shame because I think it doesn't do justice to many different groups and many different situations. And I am happy to see this renaissance and I hope there will continue to be many more. Yeah. I One thing that I believe is that, you know, we're going to see a broadening of stories already with this story. I feel like my generation has told stories about singular identities. Sherman Alexie is Coeur d'Alene, Spokane Coeur d'Alene, and he comes from one tribe. And he had sort of a rural to urban upbringing, and that was the first truly urban writing that came out from Native native country. And Louise Erdrich is kind of the same. She, she kind of captures her characters that are Ojibwa. What I see younger generations doing and what I've done in this book is to kind of portray more of the intersectional identities that we have in Native country. So my mother is Chicana and my father is Native American. And sort of what that blending in an identity causes, the sort of struggles that emerge from that. And, you know, I am the director of the MFA CW program at the Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And many of my students, you know, they come from colleges like Stanford and they come from tribal colleges. But what's unique about them is that they are truly world citizens. They have blended backgrounds oftentimes. And the stories that they tell are becoming increasingly complex. And um, I really wanted to lead the charge with that because there's too much of a simplification sometimes, I feel like, in Native literature. And that's not what I see in our general population. That's a very valid point. And I really enjoyed that aspect of your book. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting was that you chart your own story alongside some of the movements that have happened in our country during your lifetime. 
that took a long time to do. I'm not going to say it was easy. You know, you're juggling so many balls when you're writing a full length book or even a, a short story collection or whatever it is you're working on. I really privileged in the beginning a narrative arc about a child coming of age. And then later, when I went back in to edit it after it had sold, I circled back and I thought, okay, now where can I infuse some of the history of, um, like you said, political movements in this country, governmental policies? How, can I weave those in without breaking the narrative arc? I did not want to write a nonfiction book that read as a dry history. I think that those books they don't always get read. And this is vital, vital American history. I won't even call it Native history. It's this history that we all share as Americans. And too many people, they don't see it clearly. They just do not understand. And I felt like there was this opportunity to show the way these are not remote things that happened. You know, the, the uranium mine near my grandmother's house at Laguna Pueblo, um, the Indian Relocation Act that got my father trained as a welder. Um, the effect of World War II on so many Native tribes, the Major Crimes Act and the way it played into my father's sentencing as a minor. All of these things could kind of be hung adjacent to the story of my coming of age. And I told my editor when I started to work on the final draft that infused some of the history into the book, I told her, don't let me digress too far. Don't let me lose the story, the emotional story of this child that I hope people connect to. And she told me, Deborah, I promise I won't. And so together, I became confident enough to kind of start to break apart the narrative a little bit and hang some of the history on it. And I was very pleased with kind of the light thread of context now that was woven into the book in the final edit. And I think that's one of the things I'm most proud of in the story is it's not a memoir as in a memoir that is just about me. It really is reflective of, of a larger period in history. And I think you're exactly right that a lot of people don't know a lot of this history. They may know isolated portions of it, but that's what I felt like. Like I was aware of some of the parts, but I did not have all of the history by any means. So I loved learning it all. And I feel like it's very important for all of us to learn. But also then weaving it in with your personal story and how that impacted you and your family and your broader family and your community. And I feel like that is the greatest way to learn because you're right. I think these straight historical books don't often get read because they do get a little dry. And so infusing in your personal experience, how these things impacted you, how they made you go one direction or another direction, but also then teaching us some of the things we might not know, put those together, came out with an absolutely stunning book. Thank you. That makes me so happy. You know, I I was very aware of the need to entertain. You know, people in this country, they have a lot of ways that they can stay, you know, they can watch Netflix or HBO Max, the number of television channels and magazines and books that are available. We have a constant, we have constant sources for entertainment. And if someone is going to pick up your book, what will make them turn the page and go to the next page and the next chapter? And so I did everything I could to infuse it with a bit of humor. I tried to make the language as lyrical as I could. And, you know, I, you talked about how negativity sells and, you know, I didn't want to sugarcoat anything. I mean, I think that my family had struggles. Definitely there were struggles that um, my grandparents and my parents and even I myself had to endure. But I think waiting to write the book until I got a little older and also taking a very long time to process the material. This book took eight years and I was offered publication in 2018. Carmen Maria Machado chose it for a book award and it was a smaller press, but at that time it was tempting. And I thought, you know, I just, I want to wait and I want to keep reworking it and reworking it and reworking it and keep reaching to make it perfect, make it the way I wanted it to be. And um, I'm really happy with the way it came out too, because I feel like it does a good job of, of balancing the struggles, but also the joys of growing up with a big family, a big fun family. You know, my mom was the eldest of 15 kids. My father was the fifth of 10. And I have a bunch of siblings myself. We had this girl gang. And so through the worst struggles of my life, there was always kind of the the fun and the goofiness and the kind of the hijinks of having family around. And I hope that joy comes through. Absolutely. 
I mean, of course, any memoir is going to have the ups and the downs, and I think it's very important to represent all of it. But sometimes it's hard for me when I read a book that is only grim. Like it's difficult, I think, sometimes as much crazy stuff is happening in our world right now to then want to purposely dive into a very grim story. So I'm always happy when they are more balanced. I want to learn what happened. I don't want it to be sugarcoated. But I also don't want to just feel like, oh, my gosh, this is so heavy and it's never going to be happy at all. I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, there's a there's a combination, you know, for me, assuming responsibility for the crazy mistakes that I made and, you know, understanding how I was shaped by society. I do believe that a good memoir tells you what happened, but a great memoir tells you what happened and how that character or that persona or that individual was sort of shaped by the forces of the society that they grew up in. And so I tried to show like the reclamation that took place for me growing up in a in the sort of era of the native diaspora is what I call it, after the Indian Relocation Act. A lot of people know about the great black migration that happened from the South up to the Midwest, but not that many people know that there was this huge migration of Native American people because of the Relocation Act off reservation. That was my generation. And so with that comes sort of loss of an intact culture, population, your aunties and uncles who would have taught you things, you just lose them. And suddenly you're embedded in a community that is not your own community. And there's a sense of loss in that. And I was a stubborn, bullheaded little kid. You know, I think my sisters were like, yay, I'm going on spring break in Mexico with my girlfriends from high school. And I was the weird one who was kind of, you know, dabbling in vegetarianism. And I was an environmentalist and I wanted to learn about my ancestors And at the time, it was not a popular thing. You know, the 80s were like, it was the era of like I had said, you know, Reagan and, you know, everybody was dressing very preppy and material girl was the thing. And here I was kind of like this flannel wearing hiker who was always outdoors. And I hope what comes through is really this notion of a child who is stubbornly determined to reconnect with what feels most true to her. And in my heart, that has always been an appreciation of the earth and a kind of, I value a lot the indigenous worldview that was lost in my family. I have inspired sort of that return for many of my siblings and certainly my father just by being who I am, you know, in the world. And that's rewarding. Sweet Tarts dared to combine sweet and tart. But we didn't stop there. We combined soft and bouncy to bring you new Sweet Tarts Gummies Fruity Splits, a uniquely delicious dual-sided gummy with one side that's sweet and one side that's tart, but entirely smooth and squishy. Mmm, a powerfully perfect combo. Sweet Tarts, dare to combine. This episode is brought to you by Progressive, America's number one motorcycle insurer. Everything is more exhilarating when you're on your motorcycle. Just like your bike is more protected when you choose Progressive Motorcycle Insurance. They offer coverage for your bike, starting as low as $75 per year. And they keep things affordable with discounts like paid in full, multi-policy, and responsible driver. So raise your kickstands and get to quoting at Progressive.com to see if you can save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. $75 premium is for state minimum coverage. Not available in D.C. Discounts not available in all states or situations. I love that. And that actually leads me into my next question which has to do with, as you tell your story, and you have a large family and many relatives, how did you approach that in terms of including others in your story and making sure that you were able to tell your story, but you were also honoring other people and you didn't end up alienating some of your family members? You know, I think that um, writing fiction or calling it fiction would have been alienating. I do. I think that There's a way in which, you know, if you hide behind the characters of a novel and, you know, I was tempted by that. I thought, well, I could, I could kind of protect myself and be less vulnerable if I did a work of auto fiction, but I don't think that it would honor sort of the courage and the struggles of my father and my siblings and my grandparents. And I think that nonfiction has a a political impact that fiction can't have. I remember as a child, and I know it sounds like a cliche, but I read Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and there were no books written by Native women. There were no memoirs that were like a realistic portrayal of what it is to grow up in America, you know, and I needed that. I wanted it, and it was the closest thing I could find, and I thought, 
she's allowed to say this. She's allowed to say this out loud. Nobody's going to get mad at her. No one's going to stop her. It meant everything to me. And, you know, all my life, I looked for that comprehensive memoir that wasn't just about an individual from a Native woman. And I just couldn't find anything that felt satisfying. And then I thought, you know, I, that's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write something that is not just about me, but is about the community and everything that we have endured. And, you know, people will say, like, why did you tell that story? That's a, that's a story that doesn't portray you very well, or it shows the difficulties here or there in your family. But if we hide what has happened, it suggests some sort of shame. And I don't feel ashamed. I feel very proud of my family. And I think that by portraying all of the events, in some ways, it's an indictment of, of poor policies. And it's, there's hope in that indictment that perhaps people will recognize that things need to be improved on because we still have issues in Native country, healthcare issues, many issues that I highlight in the book. And if they can spur people who have power to kind of sit up and take notice that, you know, the first Americans, the original Americans who are here are still not always treated as they should be, um, then I, you know, I'll feel very pleased. But it's a gift, really. You know, you don't give people a gift and then expect something in return. And so, I mean, at the very, just the very base level, the thing that brings me great joy is just even hearing that, you know, when people now send me an email or people have blurbed the book and it's been very, you know, they've been very enthusiastic. That feels like what art is, you know, you kind of shoot your arrow out into the world and you can't really control where it lands. But in my biggest dreams, it would make a difference, this book in this country. People would read it and really take note and see that it's, you know, it's, it's this comprehensive memoir that I don't know has existed before now. I agree with all of that. And I think that is one of the reasons I was so excited for your book was I had not read anything like it before. I guess my question more is, did you say to your family, you're going to appear in this memoir? Is that OK with you? Or did you just write the story because it is important and you do want people to know? And I agree, you're not going to write a memoir about yourself where you look perfect. I mean, no one is. Yeah. But did you say to them, do you want to look at this ahead of time? Or did you just write hoping they would be OK with it? You know, they knew from the time I was very young, I would say even by the end of the the book when I'm a teenager and I'm leaving to go to Yellowstone, that I was I was writing, that it was something that I did and that it was something that I would likely do. My father always used to tell me I, from a time when I was really little, like, you know, you'll, you're going to end up being a writer because I would write things and give them to him. And he would say, oh, we should send this to the Reader's Digest. Like he was always very <laughs> supportive. But my mother didn't like it. So when I was young, my mother, she loved Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. She loved novels. She read voraciously. She was a big reader and she also liked to watch television, but she was really reluctant to give me permission. And so as a writer, what you do is you write and you let it sit on your desk. I've had things that sat on my desk for 10 years and then they went out and they were published to great acclaim, but they had been sitting for a very long time. There are a lot of ethical considerations when you write a memoir. And I was certainly very worried about the way that she felt. My father was always like, you tell your story, it's your story. My mother was always like, I don't like this. I don't like the idea that you're doing this. And then she got cancer about a decade ago. And she started to change her story. She started to become more supportive. When I was in Iowa City at the MFA, they came out for my graduation. They came to a reading and there was sort of a full turnaround where she was like, I'm proud of you and I hope this gets done. But still, I think it's, it was stuck with me, her early reluctance, and she did not emerge as a character on the page. The pandemic hit. She passed away at the the beginning of the pandemic, which was a gift because she had been sick for a long time and we were able to be with her. It, it literally happened a month before the pandemic blew up. And um, I wrote the opening of the book right after her funeral. And I went all the way back. Like I told you, I rewrote the book so many times. During the pandemic, my mother emerged on the page like 100% more than she had been before. It had been really a book about my father. And my mother's character emerged. And some of that was a conversation that we had when she was dying and she was on her deathbed. And I knew that she felt like it was okay. She had given me permission finally. You know, I just always gave myself the task of making sure that I exposed myself on the page more than I did anybody else. Like I was going to tell my deepest, darkest secrets on the page because it's not fair to offer up people in your family and then to hide your own 
problems. And then when the book really was done, I told my dad, I'm sending it to my editor. Do you want to see it now? And you can nix anything or correct anything or do anything that you want to to it. And he told me, no, I do not want to. I will wait until the galley comes out. So when the galleys came out, I mailed him a copy. He got it in January and he read it in two days. And he wrote, he called and he said, um, it's very interesting. <laughs> and then we kind of laughed about it. And he was like, I said, I'm, did you see in the end? I said, if I get anything wrong, I'm sorry. And he said, oh, you might have got a few things a little, you know, kind of, you know, he was kind of teasing me, but he was basically saying that he, he really liked it. He said, it makes me want to be a writer too. And he is a storyteller, you know, but he was very, very kind. And um, my siblings, I did not give, I did not give them the book before. None of them asked and I didn't give it to them. And, um, you know, I'm prepared to have people in my family, even people from my tribe that might have problems with it. And, um, you know, it, it takes courage. The two people that I really worried about, though, were my parents. And I think if my mother had not given me permission before she had died, I don't know that the book would be what it turned out to be. I don't know that I could have published it. I, I, feel, I feel protective and I feel respect for my parents. And so, yeah, that's a really good question for anyone who's trying to write memoir. It's, there's a lot to think about. I think that's right. And I think it comes from me. I, I am not planning to write any kind of memoir, but I am a very private person. And so every time I'm talking to somebody who's written a memoir, I just think, oh, my gosh, if someone that I knew close to me was writing a memoir, I think I would it would freak me out and it would send me into a bit of a tizzy just because I am so private. But I think everything you said is very valid and people need to tell their stories. But it always just sort of makes me wonder, like, how are people responding? Yeah, it's it's very frightening. You know, I have turned around and told my children if any of you end up writing, you can write what you need to about me. You know, it's a way that people process their their history and their identity. And I, in some ways, you can trust that publishers won't take something from you that is feels unfinished. And we've all, well, you know, you you read a lot of times student works because I'm a teacher. I read memoirs that, um, you know, pieces, personal essays that feel that the, you know, they're not, they haven't come to fruition yet. They haven't found their structure. There's some bitterness in it. And that's what you have to make peace with as a, as a memoirist is that your early drafts, they are going to be a lot of venting and a lot of fear and a lot of hiding from yourself. It's really hard to kind of reach the point where you're start, starting to be honest with yourself on the page because we're all ridiculously kind of coy with ourselves. I'll get early drafts and look at them and think, well, that's a lie. And then I have to rewrite it and rework it and rework it to the point where I understand that there is truth in what I'm saying. And that's what you're trying to do when you write a memoir is be as honest and as vulnerable as possible. And you have to be a little egoless to, egoless to get to that place, you know, and it, it takes time. It's, it's a long process. I think writing a memoir, it does take a long time because of cognitive dissonance. There are a lot of different reasons. So it's a hard thing. And working through various issues, I, I assume you found it cathartic. Um, yeah, I don't think that art is meant to be cathartic, but I do think that, um, you know, we tell ourselves stories about our, you know, you tell yourself a story, you create, we all do it. We, we make of ourselves a protagonist in our own mind. And you can tell yourself that you're wounded by the world and that the world is doing this to you. And as you mature, your story changes and you realize, well, actually, I contributed to this problem that I'm having by X, Y, Z. And, you know, you start to see yourself more clearly. And that's what people do in, um, certainly with therapists, they learn to retell their story in more empowering lights. And um, a writer is doing that by themselves at the table. So, you know, the thing about writing is when you write a scene that took 60 seconds to occur in your life, but you've written the scene over and over for 12 days in a row, the memory of writing it kind of supersedes then the memory of living it. So when you look back at certain memories that you have captured on the page, you feel this sense of joy because it's a beautiful scene that you've created. Now, was your experience of living that moment, did it feel joyful? No, it was a difficult moment. But you've rendered some sort of pain or trauma. And I use the word trauma in terms of like any heightened memory, it can be positive or negative. But you know, you've rendered this moment artful 
and it feels good. So I, I think that kind of it's a subsidi- subsidiary of of creating art is that you do have something cathartic happen. Although I, I don't think it's good to go into art thinking that that's that's what your aim is. Oh, I agree with that. But I hear authors often say that once they have gotten it down, that it did feel cathartic or that they were able to reframe it or understand it better yeah. or just come to terms with it, whatever the right terminology for that is. Exactly. You're exactly right. Yep. Mm-hmm. You said much more succinctly what I just said. Yep. <laughs> well, usually I feel like it's the other way around, that I will take forever <laughs> to get something out and then somebody will say it in two sentences. I'm like, yes, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's what you did. <laughs> What surprised you the most when you were writing Whiskey Tender? I think understanding, you know, my father had this job that was very difficult. I saw him get up at four o'clock in the morning and go out to this dirty power plant. And he was simultaneously proud that he was bringing home a paycheck because his family had been truly impoverished his entire life and kind of conflicted about working at a power plant as an indigenous person. And all of his coworkers, they were all indigenous, you know, they, they were in these dirty jobs. And as I came into sort of a value, valuing my indigenous inheritance and my ancestors more and more as a teenager, I was pretty bitter about the fact that he worked at the power plant and kind of bratty and judgmental and confused. And I think writing the book, understanding that I had done that to him was really shocking. Like I always appreciated my dad, but I think when I got to that juncture in the book and I discovered how unfair I had been and kind of ungrateful for everything that, that how little I had understood him and my mother as well. I think that's always shocking as a child because we put our parents on these pedestals and we criticize them and we love them, but we're not always treating them as other human beings. We treat them as our mom and our dad. And um, I just learned so much about my relationship with them and and kind of the intergenerational aspects of our relationship through writing the book. And that's astounding, you know, and I look at my own children now and, you know, all children, no one thinks that their parents did a perfect job, but it makes me understand that, you know, it's hard to understand people from other generations until you really start to think about sort of the history and the politics and the era that they grew up, we all kind of live in our own generation. And we kind of, we see the world through this lens of the decades that we were born in. And this book really broadened my perspective on my grandparents and my parents' generation and made me appreciate them so much more. And I think as you age and you become a parent or even just have a job and have the responsibility of supporting other people, living in the world, that you really understand your parents better too. I mean, I think that is something I dealt with as well. You know, you get so frustrated with some of the choices they made, the things they did. And as you're older, you're like, okay, there was so much more going on. But also, I think that what your book really hits home about is that we are products of the generations that we live in. And for you, there were very specific things that that entailed in terms of the native customs and finding your identity and all of that. And I feel like that was very important and I learned a ton, but it also just reminded me even for myself that, and my parents, that you are a product of the time that you're raised because there's so much happening around you and all of that gets infused into your life. Exactly. Again, you say it in such a succinct way. You're repeating what I've said, but differently. And it's, it kind of underscores exactly how I feel. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And it just is what I think resonated so much with me about your book, because I felt that I learned a lot about a specific thing, but then I also was able to internalize some of it about my life as well. That's wonderful. The cover. I'm a huge cover person and title. (laughs) But your cover is stunning. Will you tell me a little bit about how it came about? Hmm, let me think. Well, the, the original editor on my project saw me through all of the revisions and then left Harper. So I was given a new editor and we did the cover together. And she basically asked me to send her covers that I enjoyed and covers that I didn't enjoy. And so I, I did. And then I sent her some family photos. And then we talked about how a lot of the themes are kind of, you know, out about the outdoors. And um, I don't know how the cover came out. That's a really interesting question. I feel like I'm flailing at answering it because 
I knew that I didn't want a big picture of myself as the cover. <laughs> a lot of times <laughs> that people will do that, where it's just like this big photo of this individual. And it doesn't feel, again, it's not a memoir about an individual. It's a community and it's intergenerational. And so the juxtaposition of my father and his brothers as young boys with my father and my sisters and I in the front, it felt really wonderful. It felt right. And then we have, of course, a, a little landscape alongside the bottom. And um, they, they sent it over and it was perfect. They sent two covers. One was black and red, and it looked kind of like a modern, but it still had the two photos. And then they sent over the one that I chose. It just spoke to me. It felt natural. You know, it felt it felt right. And so I didn't, we didn't labor over it very long. We were all on the same page and it kind of has like an adobe, you know, it has kind of an earth, earthy orange tan color that I really like. Me too. I feel like it really encapsulates your memoir. What about Whiskey Tender as the title? <sighs> you know, it's catchy. I, th I feel like Whiskey Tender is something that it's a title that people will remember. It's kind of like Whiskey Tango, but it also captures sort of the wild tenderness of my family. And it also kind of foregrounds a challenging concept about Native people right from the get-go. It just puts it on the table with the word whiskey. A lot of people have this sort of default notion of Native people, you know, and their drinking problems. It just, it feels, I feel like it will make most readers stop and think, whoa, whiskey's in the tender. But with the word tender, that's kind of a, a high-low juxtaposition or like a incongruous thoughts or kind of, you know, at odds with each other, those two words. And, you know, sort of the joys of growing up in a big family that is certainly very wild, but the tenderness of that same family, the idea that People are not limited to one or the other. I have been thrilled with all of the advanced praise that the book has received, certainly. And some of the starred reviews, one of them called my father an alcoholic. And I really had to stop and kind of laugh because I thought if I had to call my father any kind of addict, I would have called him a workaholic because um, he could stop drinking. You know, now some of my uncles and other family members, once they started drinking, they didn't stop drinking. And, you know, it, ultimately it, killed them. But that wasn't my father. But it underscores what I'm saying, that expectations coming into a lot of Native fiction and Native nonfiction is that there's going, there's going to be a struggle with, with drinking or with drugs or with... And, you know, I don't want to deflect it and say that it's not true, but I also don't want to leave it in that sort of stereotypical notion of kind of like trauma and down and outness. It's wasn't like that for me in my experience growing up. And I have never personally had a, a problem with alcohol. So I just decided to foreground it. That's so interesting. It is definitely catchy. And I was curious for the origins of it and how you decided on it as your title. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's going to ask that question. Um, I interviewed Colin McCann last year at the Santa Fe International Literary Festival. And, you know, he's from Ireland, a very well-known author. And he told me, you know, in Gaelic, the word whiskey means water of life. And, I, you know, I love that. I love this notion that plants that grow on the earth and kind of can be transformed into something like whiskey or like we, we you know, we talk about different power plants. I write about different power plants in the book, that there is this potential for them to be seen as a gift beyond the sort of concept of abuse. And, um, you know, it's it's just complicated, but I like the way that it does hearken to a wild tenderness. You know, in Native America, there's always been this passionate spirit, this fighting spirit. You know, even in the face of oppression, we're kind of obstinate and determined to survive. That's the way it looks. And so there's sort of a wildness in the word whiskey and then the word tender. It shows the love that I felt in my family. Despite the problems that we went through, there is sort of a togetherness. There is, um, there's a support system there that I have always felt, and I still feel today. They're all so excited about the book, even though they're in the book. And I know that they're going to be challenged by some of what I've written. My sisters are all super excited flying out to some of my book tour events. So I, I think it's true to my family. 
I love that. And I love that they're coming to some of your book events. I know. It's fun. <laughs> That's so fun. <laughs> well, before we wrap up, Deborah, what have you read recently that you really liked? Oh, I loved Shudder by Ramona Emerson, who is a graduate of the IAIA MFA CW. I also really loved a short story collection by a writer named Stacy Denisozzi. It's called The Missing Morning Star. It does a fabulous job of kind of encapsulating the life of a young Diné Navajo woman in all of her kind of dating and the things that are going on with her. It's a really wonderful addition to the short story collections coming out of the Southwest. Um, and then there's a, a writer that I love named Amanda Peters, who wrote The Berry Pickers. And it's so interesting because it's a border story um, set, though, on the Canadian and the U.S. border. And it's an indigenous tale of a child who gets lost, kidnapped, and it has had phenomenal success for good reason. It is such a lovely read. And the last one that I will name is The Strange Beautiful by Carla Crujito, which is also a really wonderful collection. Those are the last four books that I've read, actually, in order, and they're all really wonderful. Well, I'm not familiar with a couple of them, but The Berry Pickers was one of my favorite books of last year. And I interviewed Amanda. I just loved that book as well. I think it's beautiful. And I like that you go into it knowing who the two characters are, but it's more an understanding of what happened and why. Yes. Uh huh. I really love it too. I think it's so, it's such a quiet, beautiful prose style. And I like the structure. I got to read it when it was still in its thesis form, but it was about to come into the world. And I'm just so impressed with her and very excited for her, her short story collection that will be out soon with Harper. That's right. And Shudder has been on my list for a long time and I haven't read it. And I'm glad you're reminding me. And then I need to track down these other two. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Shudder is um, the, you know, it's told in kind of present day to past and kind of back and forth. And the childhood, there's an adult photographer in the book, but then there's a, there's kind of her origin story as a child in the kind of interstitial chapters and the ones with her and her grandmother as she's coming to learn about her gift as a seer and a hearer of dead people is, um, it's, it's so wonderful. I really like it. Okay, good. I will make sure I bump it up the list because I've heard nothing but wonderful things about it. Well, Deborah, thank you for taking the time to chat with me. I can't wait for your book to make it out into the world and I really appreciate your time. I'm so grateful for you. It makes me feel very, very happy that you, you enjoyed it. And I, I'm happy that we got to talk today. Me too. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. We've all got those parts of our house where the internet just won't go. Well, if you had wall-to-wall -wall Wi-Fi from Xfinity, you could worry less about dead spots. Because with wall-to-wall -wall Wi-Fi from Xfinity, you get fast speeds, reliable connection in every room, and power for all your devices, even when everyone's online. That's wall-to-wall -wall Wi-Fi. Only on the Xfinity 10G network. Restrictions apply. Not available in all areas. Actual speeds vary. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. I would love to connect with you on Instagram or Facebook, where you can find me at Thoughts From a Page. If you enjoy this show, please consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. If you have a moment to rate the show or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts, I would really appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And please tell all of your friends about Thoughts from a Page. Word of mouth does wonders to help the show grow. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. You know, a lot can happen in seven minutes, and luckily, that's how long it takes me to tell a story. My name is Aaron Califato, and I'm the creator of 7-Minute Stories. I'm proud to partner with Evergreen Podcasts, and I'd like to invite you to join me on this journey. I'm going to take you on some crazy roller coaster rides using my unique extemporaneous storytelling style, and together, we're going to try to make sense of the world. 
all through the art of storytelling and all in approximately seven minutes. Don't you know that you're a grown up? I'm a grown up. Me too. Yep, me too. But you know, these days being a grown up can really suck. Luckily, we're grown ups who grew up in the coolest generation. We had video arcades. And also some of the best TV and movies ever made. We lived the origin of awesome consumer electronics. The list goes on and on. Yep, Generation X. Exactly. And we're Gen X Grown Up. Every week, the Gen X Grown Up podcast explores media, tech, toys, games, and more from both yesterday and today. Through the eyes of Generation Xers who absolutely love that stuff. You can find us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Or find us on our website, genxgrownup.com. All right, you think that was good enough? I I hope so, man. I'm tired. (laughs) Who listens to a promo on a podcast and then goes and listens to a different podcast? Right. I've never done it. (laughs) Right.